on the edge, over the edge, and on the cutting edge. All of these things will be part of our sewing fun during the show today as we focus on finishing the edges of sewing projects. The way an edge is finished truly makes the difference in the final creation. Our guests today are knowledgeable at both hand and machine finishing details. I believe you're in for a treat hearing their tips and seeing their techniques. We have a few more surprises for you and we are thrilled that today you have joined us. Welcome to my sewing room. I'm so pleased to have as my guest today, my very dear friend, Louise Cutting. Louise is the owner and designer of Cutting Line Designs and Patterns. Louise, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Martha. I'm glad to be back. And what are we gonna do today? I'm gonna do some bias binding, but my it. way. Okay, good, good. The bias binding that you see there is cut one-to-one. -one. That means there's no less or no more bias binding than the actual circumference of the neck or the armhole. And when it's stitched together, it is stitched and placed in a very unusual spot. We'll turn this it's around. not a design element. It so it's not going to be placed in the center back and it's not going to be placed on the shoulder seam. It's about two inches off the center back off to one side. This is where so, the sewing line is. Mm -hmm. So any bias binding can just be kind of rotated so that it finishes right there. Okay. Now, normally bias binding has the diagonal edges and when those are stitched together and fold it in half, the diagonal is never on top of itself. So it, it is very difficult to make sure that your bias binding is truly folded in half. I prefer stitching it straight. So it's perpendicular. I've cut these seams straight. Oh, They're perpendicular okay. so that when this folds on top of itself, you can see that your bias binding has folded exactly where it's supposed to. Now, it is going to be folded in half, not pressed in half. Every place you've ever read or any pattern company, it always says press it in half. I will do that, but it'll be at the very end. That, think of a paper towel roll with paper wrapped right around, it's very small wrapped right around the cardboard, but it's quite large when it wraps around the whole outside. The same thing happens here. Let this fold tell you where this crease finally needs to be. When I go to pin my bias binding in half, by the way, I use eight times the width, not seven times the width. It makes your life a whole lot easier when you have to roll it around the raw edge. I like to put my pins exactly where my stitching line is going to be. At this particular one, it's going to be stitched about a presser foot away, about a quarter inch away. So the little picks of all my pins are done right at a quarter inch. That's the only place the seam's ever supposed to match. So here is my stitching line. Again, this has been folded, but not pressed hard. When we go to press it, it has been pressed away from the garment. It is now going to be stab pinned right into our ironing board right past the stitching line. Now the fabric is telling you exactly where that is supposed to be and you can now go and press it. It'll also, you can press in between there'll be less fabric on the underside than there is on the outside. When your entire bias binding is pressed into place, what I do is use the fusible web with a paper release. I roll this back open. I place the fusible web right underneath, pull it off, and I will go and press it into position. No pins will be involved at all when you finally go to stitch this by machine. Now this has been wrapped from the inside to the outside. 
again, most patterns and books tell you to press, tell you to stitch your bias binding on the outside and wrap it to the inside. I like to wrap mine because I saw it in the designer element. It's pinned and stitched from the wrong side, wrapped to the, the outside. Wrapping is on the outside, outside of the garment. And then you're going to edge stitch right along within the bias binding. And if you use it, as there is on the sample, you use the same color thread, you never see the stitching line. Well, that is amazing, Louise. I've never seen this where it was really wrapped to the outside it's of the It's wrapped to the outside. Now I have one, I know you oh. are the queen of heirloom. <laughs> so I have one quite interesting way that if you don't wanna see stitching on either the inside or the outside, because you've used the fine fusible web, you can roll this back taking your hand needle and use a running stitch. You can pick the inside of your bias binding right into your original stitching line all the way along and that way you have no seam stitching line on either the inside or the outside. Now do that one more time. How do you fold that? that and here, this will be true on heirloom or whether you're doing something with exactly, a larger bias like exactly. this. Okay, that, you do this is the way it's already been folded fused. Folded to the inside here, but you could, if you wanted to fold to the outside. Yes, to the the, either side. You can do okay. it the conventional way, stitching on the outside, flipping okay. it to the inside. But this way, this is now wrapped and folded back so you're just seeing the little lip of your bias. Okay. And you're taking your hand needle with thread. By the way, I like to hand sew in silk thread. I run it through beeswax and I iron it. When because you're doing hand sewing? When I'm doing hand sewing. And you iron it. I iron it that. the beeswax, of course. No, I iron, oh. I iron the beeswax into the thread. You're kidding me. No. Do you have to use a press cloth? For no, that? no, it also makes your iron slick. <laughs> That's pretty good. <laughs> but no, th this way, when, uh, when I was always taught to hand sew using beeswax, you just start hand sewing. Well, the beeswax is back at about the first four stitches, where if you have ironed the thread with the beeswax in it, it is impregnated into the thread. Wow. It doesn't wrinkle. It doesn't knot. You can, you can do the you know, 30, 40, 50 inches, which most people want to do because they don't want to thread their needle more than once. And it doesn't <laughs> knot up at all. Wow. So it's this way, trick. this rolls back and you can pick one into the underside of your bias, the other into your original row of stitching. Normally bias isn't any place where there is stress. So this is just going to be just a little running stitch running completely along with your bias binding and your garment. So you and see no stitching. You see no stitching whatsoever. And that way I think would be absolutely gorgeous on heirloom garments. Well, bias trims and bias bindings are absolutely such a part of our life in, in the heirloom world. And obviously they're part of the decorative life it, in the couture world also. It, it, it will enhance the price of your garment if you don't have facings. Ready to wear rarely uses facings. They rarely use, really use the bias binding. You know what, facings are not very pretty, are they? No, they're not, and they normally roll out. Yeah, we used to use facings a lot, but not anymore, I, I've noticed that. They were afraid to use bias binding in home sewing because they didn't think that the home sewer would know how to work with it. That is a very interesting, but we do, don't we? We do now. We've come a long way, we haven't have. we, Louise? From the time when I was in home ec and my mama was putting all those facings in my clothes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Louise. You're and welcome. And now Louise has some more sewing inspirations to share with you. Louise, this blouse is fascinating to me. Tell me what, the, what you were saying about one piece? It's one piece. It one comes, piece, no shoulder seams. No shoulder seams. There's no reason. When you think about it, why do we need a shoulder seam if it comes straight out? They cut it apart, sew it back together. Let's get rid of it. It just <laughs> makes more bulk. Okay. So it comes up the front and goes right down the back. No shoulder the seam. Only time you have to worry about it is if you have a one-way design, because what is marching up the front is marching down the back. <laughs> so, but this way, 
That's no right. shoulder seam. It has a cut on sleeve. The sleeve is long enough to cover up the cap, top cap of your arm. Okay. And it has the pretty bias binding. The pretty bias binding. And it is very flattering. It's high up towards the face. If you start getting real low down mm -hmm. in as far as a U neck, it starts show. It brings your face down. So this way, it keeps all the interest up around your face. How long does it take you to make one of these? Uh, about an hour. An hour. That's yeah, amazing. The, the bias binding takes longer the than the garment. Takes yeah. longer than the garment. Oh, this is another wonderful bias now, binding. This one has about 180 inches of bias binding. Wow. So the bias binding I just showed you, you could never do that with pins. Pinning the bias binding. By the time you would have finished sewing all that, you would have had this big hump of bias that you would have had to get rid of. But the little top, the shell had no shoulder seams. This has no side seam. No side seams. Louise, you are you are a genius. Now this is fascinating. All right, tell us how you got <laughs> both, this, we have laughed. Both on. garments are exactly the same. Okay. The one underneath has a real high capped armhole. Okay. The vest over top has exactly the same armhole but without the sleeve. The neckline has been lowered, and I use a real important um, curvature. I use the end of a turkey platter because it's exactly the same on both sides. A French curve has a flat side, where this way you're going to get the, a great curve. The neckline is a turkey platter. A turkey platter. <laughs> that it has, well, my housekeeper keeps on thinking I'm doing nothing but eating in my sewing room because I have an entire series of dishes from a demi tasse all the way up to a turkey platter. They're all clean, but I'm using all the curves on them <laughs> because you get a wonderful curve on all these different sizes. I love it. I so love the it. front end was the end of the turkey platter. The back end was the side of the okay. turkey platter. Okay. Louise, this is wonderful. <laughs> Louise, thank you so You're much. You're welcome. <laughs> and next I have some hand embroidery to share with you. I'm so happy to have as my guest today, my very dear friend, Wendy Shane. Wendy is the owner of Wendy Shane Design. She also produces petite pochet patterns. Wendy is a regular contributor to So Beautiful magazine, and she has studied at the Royal School of Needlework in London. Wendy, welcome to the show. Thank you, Martha. It's always great to be here. I brought with you today a sample garment that shows perfectly uh, what a handmade buttonhole looks like. So we're going to talk about that today, but first I want you to look at the sample and then we'll get started. So let's go ahead. Now um, if you look at my hoop, I've drawn out the, the buttonhole um, boundary with a straight line down the middle and a dotted line around the edges. Now. Um, First thing I want to do is I want to tie on with a waist knot, and of course I'm using uh, large thread and a larger needle than normal uh, to do this. So um, normally I would use the, sa the size thread that would be um, compatible with the fabric I was using. So uh, anyway, I want to continue with my running stitch. And a running stitch is simply an in and out stitch that is longer on top and shorter on the bottom. Uh, as with anything in embroidery, it's more important to have the padding stitches on top than on the back. Once you get to the end, just gonna bring the thread down. I wanna take the needle down now that I'm at the, I've gone completely around. Take it down, but come up just before the center line. What I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna work a blanket stitch, a closely laid blanket stitch around the top edge of the buttonhole first. So I'm going to go in and down and a blanket stitch is simply a straight stitch but the thread is held below the needle as you tighten. Now these stitches are going to go one beside the other. And try to keep even tension as you do this. Oops. I normally don't make my buttonholes in an embroidery hoop, but it would be easier for you to see what I'm doing uh, if I do so. That's why I'm struggling a little bit with the, um, the needle and thread. So normally I would hold this over my finger or um, just in my hand and I would be able to go a lot quicker also. So let me show you what the first row looks like once it's completed. Now. 
this hoop shows um, the entire row. And now what I would like to do is I want to show you a special way that I do my edges. After the last stitch, I want to take the needle down into the fabric right at the bottom edge of the stitch. So I'm tacking the, the little pearl down, the pearl of the stitch. And notice that I'm emerging at the lower edge of the buttonhole. Now here's where I want a bar tack. Bar tack is simply a, a stitch that is put on the edge of the buttonhole, just like if you were doing it by machine, to secure the edges. So I'm gonna do two stitches or two straight stitches or full stitches. And then on the third stitch, I'm going to emerge now at the center of the buttonhole. That's in preparation of the next tech, of the next step. So now I'm going to take the hoop and turn it around or rotate it. And we're rotating it 180 degrees. And now I'm in position to do my bottom row, which now, of course, is my top row. So I'm going to do the exact same thing. And of course, you don't want to try, you try not to stitch into the pearls of the, of the previous row. Okay, let's see. Okay, third time's not a charm. Let's try four. <laughs> okay, well, try not to do it on your sample. It's very important. Okay, so now I have another hoop which shows the completed row. I'll bring that one over. Now, this row is all stitched entirely to the end, just as before, and then I'm going to do exactly the same thing. Take it down over the last stitch and bring it to the back. And now you'll bar stitch or tack, bar tack rather, over the edge three times and then bring the thread to the back. So now that that's done, it wasn't very hard, was it? I'm going to show you, um, oh, that was the wrong sample, but let me just turn this one over. We'll work with this one. Turn it over. Now the back side is simply to take, in order to tie off, just take your thread down and bring it through the stitches on back. And that's really all there is to it, Martha. Now, um, to complete the stitch, we're gonna, you wanna cut it. So, I wanna take it out of the hoop at this point, and then take the fabric and fold it in half so that the inside of the fabric is um, visible. So now, all you need to do is take your scissors in and cut. Very carefully. Very carefully, <laughs> right. It's easier than it looks. Not to cut threads. Right. You don't want to cut the little edges of the stitches because then the stitches will come out. Okay. <laughs> Wendy, thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you it's here. It's my pleasure. And now I have some quilting ideas to share with you. I have something really interesting to share with you. It's a kind of a surprise flower because I've never seen one like it before. This beautiful baby quilt with the bluebirds and the baby and the flowers over here. But the one I'm gonna show you today, and it is such a unique idea. These are flowers with sort of a yo-yo in the center. They are turned, they're uh, lined flowers. I'm gonna show you how to make them in a minute. And then you pull up those little uh, centers. It's really a very unique technique. I think you're gonna like it a lot. I need two pieces of fabric, but I'm just gonna trace on one. But I want you to know I'm working with two pieces of fabric. I trace the large scalloped flower and I trace the little section in the center. And then I pin the two pieces of uh, same color, same fabric, two pieces together. Now, once again, I've sewn two pieces together with regular thread, not with wash away thread. And I'm going to sew all the way around the outside only, and I'm going to trim it away. So just leaving a little seam allowance and then clip the curves a little bit. Now, on the back of this, hang on, let me just turn over here. On the back, pretend like I've trimmed it all away. I need to turn this right side out, so I'm going to make a slit. Just make a slit in the back and turn it right side out. Now, I've already done that, and you know it's really critical. Anytime you have scallops and points and turns, it is so critical that it is pressed correctly and you have it just absolutely perfect because it won't be pretty if it isn't. Now, by hand, 
my little centerpiece. Just as if I'm doing a yo-yo, I come in and do a little running stitch. I bet some of you didn't know that I love to sew by hand too. All right, I'm gonna come in and do a little running stitch all the way around in the circle. See how this is beginning to look a little bit like a yo-yo? All right, by magic of television, I already have one done. So you hand stitch around in the circle and then you pull, you pull. See how this little flower becomes a yo-yo flower? I truly tell you, I've never seen one of these before. It is so unique and so cute. And then I'm gonna open up the little center flower. I guess I pulled it a little bit too tightly. I'll open it up a little bit. And then I'm, when I go to put it on the quilt, I'm gonna just tack it in a few places. Now here it is all, and by the way, there's, there's a little bit of padding that in this one that makes it look kind of pretty. And again, it gives it a little bit, uh, just a little batting is in there. It gives it just a little bit better feel a little bit better look. Now, isn't that a pretty little flower? And then when you uh, sew it on the quilt, you could just tack it in several places. And of course, if you wanted to, it could be tacked all the way around. That would be just your choice. But you see, we have a little bit of batting in that, um, in that center yo-yo, which gives it just a real pretty look. Now, isn't that a creative little flower? And now I would like for you to join me for, for me to share with you a piece from my vintage collection. This little baby dress is absolutely precious. I love round yoke dresses. And you know what I love even more? Round yoke dresses, which really aren't round in construction, but just look round. If you look with me underneath, this is a square yoke dress. And what makes it look round yoke is that we have stitched, or this uh, mother stitched the lace trim, kind of a lace fancy band on in a circle. It's much easier to make, by the way, if you want to use that idea, to make a square yoke, as you see here, and then just stitch your round, stitch your lace in a circular pattern. The little sleeve is very simple and very effective. It just has a gathered piece of lace at the bottom. The beautiful long skirt is completely plain until you get to the bottom for just pure elegance. A strip, a strip of insertion, a, a strip of fabric, a strip of insertion, and a beautiful piece of beautiful wide lace. These laces just really aren't even available anymore out of France. I have a very interesting sewing from the heart to read for you today. The Fountain City Quilters from Prattville, Alabama participate in Alabama's Home of the Brave Quilt Project, coordinated by Joe Reed of Scottsboro, Alabama. A quilt is made for the next of kin for Alabama soldiers killed in Afghanistan or Iraq. Quilts measure 48 by 84. They are replicas of those stitched during the Civil War by Northern women for the United States Red Cross. In the Civil War, soldiers used them as bed rolls and some were buried in them due to a shortage of wood for coffins. Today's blocks on our quilt have space for signatures. We obtained signatures from our governor, our mayor, and others before shipping the blocks to Mrs. Reed for quilting. We also make quilts to raffle for the American Cancer to Relay for Life event. Submitted by Linda Edwards, Prattville, Alabama, an ESA member who met Martha at ESA's International Convention two years ago. And ESA is another organization which raises so much money to benefit St. Jude Children's Research Hospital and other hospitals. And I have a sweet little short letter from Rondi Holzberg from Florida that talks about her Girl Scout troop. I am the leader of Girl Scout Troop 405, which is part of the Girl Scout Council of Tropical Florida. Our troop of girls in middle school have made pillowcases to be given to children while they are in the hospital undergoing cancer treatment. They are doing this for Concord, Concur Cancer Center here in Florida. It is a simple project that brings so much joy. Many thanks, Rondi Holtzberg. Isn't it wonderful that Girl Scouts are involved in volunteer sewing too? And by the way, I loved being a Girl Scout when I was a girl. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'd like to invite you to come back next time.